The other thing I wanted to say before we officially begin is to give a uh, acknowledgement of the fact that Center for Book Arts is located on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Lenape people. Um, in addition, if you would like access to a live transcription of this presentation that is available to you, you can see there should be a little um, a button near the top left hand of the screen that says on live on Otter AI, click here to open live transcript. And you can do that if you would like a live transcript. Um, and so, like I said, please, if you could uh, keep your video off and your uh, self muted throughout the presentation, uh, throughout Colette's pre presentation, that would be appreciated. If you have questions that you wanna ask at the end, you can do so by dropping your questions in the chat at any time um, and uh, we'll save them for the end. Or at the end, you can just turn on your video and mic to ask uh, the question in, in person or as close as we're gonna get this evening. Um, and so next, let me introduce the woman of the hour, uh, Colette Fu, whose beautiful exhibition is currently on view at CBA. So Colette Fu is a Philadelphia-based artist making complex three-dimensional compositions that incorporate photography and pop-up paper engineering. Her pop-up books are included in the National Museum of Women in the Arts, Library of Congress, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Getty Research Institute, and many private and rare archive collections. Colette's numerous awards include a 2020 Joan Mitchell Artist and Sculptors Grant, the Megan Dorfer Prize for Best Paper Engineered Artist Book, and a Fulbright Research Fellowship to China. In 2017, Colette created the world's largest pop-up book utilizing her own photographs, that pe and people could enter it at the Philadelphia Photo Arts Center. Her solo show, Wanderer, Wanderer, was presented at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in 2016 and 2017. Colette teaches pop-up courses and community workshops to marginalized populations at art centers, universities, and institutions internationally. And with that, I think I'm going to spotlight you Colette, so that you can take it away from here. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to the Center for Book Arts for letting me share my work to all of you. And I hope everyone is well, and I look forward to seeing some of you in person soon. Um, so the exhibition that's on view right now, um, before, uh, before I start showing you the work, I wanted to uh, talk, um, talk to you a little bit about the background that the project is an overall, overall part of. So I'm going to share my screen. So um, this is me on the left in 1996 with a Nosa Yi woman from my mother's ancestral home in an area called Daliangshan near the borders of Sichuan and Yunnan provinces in China. Shortly after I graduated from the University of Virginia with a degree in French language and literature, I went to Yunnan province, which you see in the bottom um, left-hand corner of China, um, to teach English at a university for ethnic minorities. Yunnan is China's most southwestern province, sharing borders with Tibet, Burma, Laos, and Vietnam. And at the time, I was unaware of what ethnic minorities were, and it wasn't until I arrived in Kunming, which is the capital of Yunnan province, I didn't. Um, I, I learned that my mom was actually from one of those minority groups called the Nosa Yi. So in Yunnan, I picked up a passion for photography to document life there to show my family and friends. These are some of the photos I took in Yunnan around 1995 and six, when my Mandarin language skills started to improve and allowed me to travel all around the province. 
So that previous photo was actually, uh, let me go back to that photo. That, that previous photo was of a, a bi minority bride and the old woman of the village is, is pouring um, dyed, pink dyed lard to bless the bride. And I had actually learned through a student that she, she was actually a distant cousin and, this, uh, and is of the bi minority. So she took me to her hometown. So I got to uh, attend this wedding. And back then I started taking photos with a cheap Yashica point and shoot, and then eventually graduated to a manual 35 millimeter camera. These photos are all of Yi people that were taken in the greater Liangshan mountains of Sichuan province, my mom's ancestral home. I spent three years in, um, in Yunnan province, and then I decided to return back to the States to study photography, and eventually got another bachelor de bachelor's degree in photography at Virginia Commonwealth University. Afterward, moved to New York City for an internship at Aperture Magazine. And after the internship, I worked several jobs and then decided to go back to school and get my MFA at the Rochester Institute of Technology. My thesis project at RIT was a series of photo collages presented in large light boxes. The light boxes were given to me from my sister who was a video store manager at Tower Video in New York City at the time. And the boxes were being updated with thinner, more efficient models. The series was titled Photo Binge. Photo Binge satirized an urban commodity driven culture that focuses on facade and the surface of things. I chose sport related backgrounds to reference bones, sweat, desire, spectatorship, competition, achievement, and the constant social habit of judging, evaluating, and comparing. This is Colorful Dishes, a balanced dish in three 34 by 48 inch light boxes. The images back then were all hand scanned from 35 millimeter film and collaged in Photoshop. This is Golf and Games in two four feet light boxes. After grad school, I exhibited uh, this body of work in Brooklyn. I rented a truck, transported, transported all the box by myself. Not only was transportation difficult, particularly going through the Holland Tunnel where I broke off my side view mirror, trying to pass another truck, but storage then became a problem. But one day at a Borders bookstore in Rochester, New York, I came upon Robert Sabuda's Wizard of Oz pop-up book. I was instantly enamored. And when I saw a call for entries for an artist residency in Michigan at the Alden B. Dow Center for Creativity, I proposed that I wanted to learn how to make a pop-up book. That residency led to a series of more residencies where I focused on learning paper engineering by taking apart dozens of commercially published pop-up books and applying what I learned to the photos for my thesis project. I started at the Malay Colony, of Arts in Austerlitz, New York, then to Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester, New York, then to the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts in Nebraska, and then to Kimmel Harding Nelson Center, also in Nebraska. So this is the series I, of 21 books that I did during those residencies. This is Balls, Sarah City Workout Mania. And Jugs. Um, Virginia Agricultural Center. Uh, so after this series, I moved to Philadelphia with a friend who was opening a Thai restaurant where I waited tables part-time while continue, continuing to attend artist residencies. I wouldn't have been able to focus on this kind of work without the support of all these artist residencies. My last was 2017 at Yaddo, Yaddo, and to date I've been over to, oh, been to over 21. I just recently started another residency in Philadelphia at the Brandywine Workshop and Archives. Uh, these residencies motivate me. 
Um, so in 2008, I received a Fulbright Award to return to Yunnan province to create photo-based pop-ups of the ethnic minority groups in Yunnan province. Um, so there are 55 officially recognized ethnic minority groups with Han as the majority. So this is a list of all of the minority groups. According to the most recent census conducted in China, which was in 2010, of the 1.3 billion population of China, less than 9% were these ethnic minority nationalities. So some older work that I've done, this is Ashima. Um, this is a, you know, I originally started making pop-up books because they were uh, portable and compact, but somehow this is a, this book is four feet, um, about three by four feet. Um, and it tells the story of Ashima, a young Sani girl who was engaged to be married to her cousin and um, the, who, the, um, the son of the vi village leader tried to force her to marry him and unleashed a trio of tigers to kill him who, who, who he, he eventually killed the tigers with arrows and escaped unscathed. Um, the base is embroidered um, in a style that is similar to the embroidery of the Sani people. This is Loma Yi Tiger Festival. My mother is Black, uh, Noso Yi, one of the many subgroups of the Yi nationality, which the gov Chinese government has grouped as one ethnicity. The Yi worship the tiger as their grandest totem. And in one area of the province, they annually, under the direction of the Black Tiger King, offer sacrifices and dance to reflect the journey and way of life of the Yi people. The men dress up in felted tiger costumes and visit, visit each house to guard the village from evils. They dance mimicking survey, surveying, plowing, harrowing, sow, sowing, and weeding all steps of the rice growing cycle to ensure a healthy crop and long life for all. This is um, for the ancestors. During the Yi ancestor ceremony, the Bima, which is a Yi shaman, performs various rituals to honor and appease our ancestor spirits. The Bima serves as a religious, cultural, social, and psychological um, leader within Yi society. So new work for this exhibit extends beyond Yunnan province and pushed me to experiment with a new kind of pop-up format. I returned to China several times after my Fulbright fellowship. In 2014, I attended a six month artist residency at the Swatch Art Peace Hotel in Shanghai. This is a view from our kitchen window. While at the residency, I did return to Yunnan, but also focused on visiting what the government calls minority autonomous regions and districts. These areas constitute 64% of China's total land and have their own local government and supposedly more legislative rights. These, um, the autonomous regions are Xinjiang, Tibet, Inner, Inner Mongolia, Ningxia, where one of China's largest Muslim population, the Hui, reside. And my friend Sally and I traveled to Guangxi province, um, which is a Zhuang autonomous region. There, within that region, there are Miao and Dong minority autonomous districts. So this is an image from the Sisters Rice Festival. And this, these are the images I chose to use for one of the works that's in the exhibition called Wings of Silver. Um, while my Photoshop file does not look this clean, but this is a way, uh, this, is the, um, this is how it looks when I decide what images I'm gonna use in the end. And then I'll print these out individually and then start um, creating layers with them and popping them up. 
Um, so it's a sister's rice festival. So this is one image that's in the back that um, you can't see uh, when, when I show you the pop-up on, on, on this virtually, but in person, you'd be able to see it. So this is, um, this is the book as it is on view at, uh, at the center. And uh, the description is every year during the Sisters Rice Festival, unmarried Miao women dress head to toe in their finest silver weighing up to 40 pounds. Long ago, the Miao carried their wealth in, in silver as they were forced down from the North. The Miao believe that silver represents light, which drives out evil spirits. Colorful glutinous rice dyed with leaves, berries and flowers is wrapped in a silk handkerchief with treasure, treasures hidden inside and is exchanged between unmarried young men and women. A pair of chopsticks or a red petal represents that the woman also likes the young man. One chopstick or a red chili pepper is a sign of rejection. Pine needles signify that the young woman is hinting that the young man should present silk and threads and that he will wait for him. She will wait for him. So the, uh, the book, I, I made it so that the cover would fold in half so that while it was on exhibit, um, it wouldn't take so much room up on the shelf. And next to the books, um, I framed some photos that were, I thought relevant to the, to the books um, in these bamboo frames and the photos are printed on hemp. This is Mai, Mai Bang, which translates as butterfly mother in Miao language. The imagery within the eggs are derived from Miao folklore, which is told through embroidery and batik. And Miao actually have a type of their own paper cutting, which, which they use to create imagery for the embroidery and the batik. Um, so Butterfly Mother gave birth to 12 eggs, which are the origin of all living beings. Everything has life. The image. Um, I bound the books in handwoven dong minority cloth, which is dyed with indigo, wild rose roots, and tree bark. The fabric is pounded with egg whites and then steamed. The dong live alongside the miao, and the miao wear this cloth. So I I. I struggled actually to find a fabric that I wanted to use um, to make the cover. And I was able to um, get some from the actual village that um, Sally and I had visited in 2014. We visited a limestone cave where Miao people have been making paper since the middle of the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty was 618 to 907 CE. This is Chuandong, 19 generations of paper making in a cave. A nearby spring provides unpolluted, neutral pH water, and neighboring mulberry trees flourish. This is my friend Sally. Um, when they have a store, a local store that will sell the, the paper that they make. Uh, and I wanted to add this because this is one of the meals that we had. Um, so these are some common dishes that you might eat uh, in that area in Southwest China. 
So these are the images that, well, not, I actually removed that water, that water um, line, um, but these are the images that are in the book. And you can see that the top layer, I used the uh, handmade paper that I actually bought while I was there. And I didn't find a use to it, use for it um, since then. So I was glad I got to use it for this book. And the man in the center, his name is Wang Xingwu. Um, and he learned paper making from his father and is the 19th generation to continue the tradition. Nothing is wasted as leftover materials are irrigated to the fields, fed to the pigs or used for firewood. <laughs> and this, and these, these videos are not gifts. There, it's just um, we don't have enough um, power to show them as video. But I do have of um, these videos, um, well, on social media, on Instagram and Facebook, if you want to see them again. And finally, from that trip, uh, this is Meow Fishing Contest. The Miao revere spirits of the natural world and depict them in their embroidery. They use paper cutting to create embroidered stories on their cl clothing to protect their families and to tell ancient myths. Every year during the Sisters Festival, the Miao of Southwest China hold a fishing contest to pray for a healthy harvest. The more fish caught, the more luck someone will have. The team that catches the most fish wins a goat and some money. Some of you may recognize that the format is inspired by Lothar Megendorfer's International Circus. And I also wanted to mention that I am showing, uh, I'm showing, I'm having a show with, alongside Lothar Megendorfer in Philadelphia at the Rosenbach Museum and Library opening next month. And there'll be a large virtual component. So the book was originally made in a larger format, about 14 feet for a fellowship I did in Philadelphia at the Center for Emerging Visual Artists. The prototype was made at an artist residency at McDowell, and then I decided to make an edition of the prototype, which I prefer to the, uh, as a more, in its more intimate form than to this 14 foot version. I'll just go through that. I'll skip through that. With the, um, you can see that one on my um, website. This is Nosu Many Layers Deep. The photo on top is from the Torch Festival in 2008. The layers of this sort of tunnel book are inspired by Nosu Yi designs used on well, so these are actually images from the Torch Festival. The image on the right, which I which I decided to hang over the book, is from 2008, and the image on the left was from my first trip to Dalianshan in around 1995. The layers are inspired by Nosoyi designs used on lacquerware, tables, bowls, shields, armors, and wine pots.
and hidden beyond the layers is a fo is the photo of me from 1995 with a woman from my mom's village. And this is the back of the book. And I wanted to share what a more upscale nasu yi meal looks like. Um, the, the meat is called totoro. It's, um, it's um, chunks of meat. And then you dip it in chili pepper. And then there's usually buckwheat pancakes, um, which you see on the left. My distant cousin Wuga called me, invited me to come to Yunnan province to attend a conference about Yi Bimoism, which once again, Bimoism is uh, shamanism. In 1995, I studied minority studies in Kunming. And while I was teaching there also, um, my professor was a lead researcher of Yi Bimoism, but unfortunately at the time, I was not so interested in the topic. So when I traveled to Daliang Shan to attend the Yi Torch Festival I'd heard about, I could not find where the festival was happening. So I went to a travel agency and asked them about that. They had many questions. Who was, who was I? Why did I wanna to go to the Torch Festival? Where was I from? Why was I traveling alone? I told them briefly that I was an American and that my family originated from Dalyangshan and they figured out who I was um, basically because our family um, was well known in, in history from the area. And so they called a distant aunt and she moved me to her apartment. She told me that she used to be very sick but one day a bima came and performed a ritual of some sort with a chicken and blood and some sticks and she was no longer sick. She even said that he disappeared. Oh, oh. So that was um, a Yibima um, welcoming us to his home during that ceremony. So that leads us into this next book, which is a star or carousel book. The Nasa ritual painting of the magical python breaks off every stubborn disease with a sword, er eradicating all kinds of epidemics. That was a quote from Mountain P Patterns, The Survival of Nasu Culture in China by Yi Studies Specialist Stephen Harrell in Washington State. I drew and digitally printed a python on special mulberry paper from when I was studying Yunnan heavy color painting in 1995 and And then this is uh, the meal that we had uh, at the Bimaw's house. 
in the center, that's uh, Yunnan ham, which is very similar to uh, Smithfield ham. And then if you've never encountered it before, that's in front, right in front of us in the center, that's lotus root. This is golden lotus feet. Boo Boo Shenglian, the king remarked, lotus springs from her every step as she danced barefoot on a floor decorated with lotus motifs. It's theorized to reference Padmavati, the deity from where lotus sprung below her feet. This is Ji Fun. She was a dancer in a woman's bound feet disco dancing team in Liu, Liu Yi village in South Yunnan province. And those are her shoes to the right. And this is a, an x-ray, a 1970s x-ray from a San Francisco hospital. The ideal lotus feet size was three twin, which is a little bit less than four inches. And this is the, the book, Closer Up. And one thing I wanted to mention, what, what was interesting about this book when I was trying to create a more interesting pop-up lotus, I, I just felt like it looked so much like other pop-up lotuses and I got frustrated and then I just crinkled everything up and, um, and when I crinkled it, I looked at it and I said, wow, that looks much better. So it was a happy accident. In 2014, I went to Inner Mongolia to attend the Nadam Festival, the festival of three manly sports, which is archery, horse racing, and wrestling. Colorful silk rep ribbons represent fire, water, earth, and air, with blue representing Mongolia, the land of eternal blue sky. Those who wear the ribbons have won before. They signify the wrestler as sacred, as these scarves are also worn by animals sacrificed to their gods. There is a legend about the great granddaughter of Genghis Khan, who claimed that she would marry any man who wagered a hundred horses and could beat her in wrestling. As a tribute to her, men now wrestle wearing an open vest to prove to their opponents they don't have breasts. Some say that this story inspired the Italian opera Turango. Because I um, didn't buy any leather when I was in Inner Mongolia, um, I ended up using Moroccan um, leather from a tannery in Tetuan, which is in Northern Morocco. I went there in 2017, I think, uh, to attend an artist residency to learn um, traditional metalsmithing.
And here's some images from the tannery in Tetuan. This was the photo that I chose to print out and display it on top of the book. And last but not least, this is Kaifuna. Uh, this is the book I was actually going to show in the exhibit, but I ran out of time um, um, as I, want, I printed on this um, hemp inkjet fabric and I had a problem with um, getting supplies of it. Kaifuna is a Dulong woman uh, in Northwest Yunnan along the borders of Tibet and Myanmar. My friend and I traveled there in 2008. The Dulong are very isolated as there is only one road leading there and during half of the year, the road is washed out by snow. We took a supply truck over from the city, Kunming, and then walked 17 kilometers along the river asking locals along the way where we could find a woman with a tattoo. At one point, the trail was washed out and three, three barefoot men formed a chain to walk us over. People kept pointing straight and then eventually they pointed up and we saw a small village of homes on the mountainside. We walked up and found her and her family peeling corn. They didn't speak Mandarin, so we peeled corn with them. I played with the boy and then a few hours later, I was able to pull out my camera. Using thorned branches and ink made from ashes of burned pine tree, Dulong girls got their tattoos at puberty and each clan has its own set of designs. The origin is not clear, but some claim it was to make them unattractive to powerful neighboring tribes who enslaved the Dulong and went after their women. Dulong women believe that their tattoos resemble butterflies and that the souls of their dead turned into butterflies. As of 2019, there were only 20 tattooed Dulong women left. Thank you. Sha, sha, sha. So that's the end of the exhibition of my presentation. Um, I'm not sure if we have time, like if, uh, if anyone wants to see a real view of the exhibit or if we want to go straight into questions yeah so i yeah i can um if you want colette uh walk over with my laptop to the installation uh that's here at center for book arts um i someone in the chat just said yes <laughs> so i'll i'll walk over with my laptop it's going to be an imperfect view um, I, if you live in the area and can make it uh, in person, Center for Book Arts is open in person again, um, Monday through Thursday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Friday and Saturday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. and admission is free with a suggested donation. So here, let me just give me one minute, Colette, and I'll, sure. I'll be back with, uh, with a view. Where would you like me to start? What, what piece? Uh, um, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll just do a little walkthrough with my laptop. I'll try to make it as smooth as possible. We'll see what happens. One moment. Here's the installation that's on view here at CBA. The eggs, the Mongolian wrestling book, which I love. Mm. And these beautiful Lotus pop-up books, Lotus pop-up book and the woman with the face tattoo pop-up book. It's truly an incredible work. And Colette, you were telling me that um, you're making another version with the hemp paper, right? Or the hemp fabric? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, um, so I finished, I finished um, the inside of it and then I, mm. I, um, then I needed to think about the cover. I struggle a lot with the cover and uh, the fabric that I wanted. Uh, I couldn't find, I, I live in, near Fabric Row in Philadelphia. 
and I still couldn't find a fabric I liked. Mm -hmm. So I, I eventually ordered it from um, India. So it's a Himalayan, it's a hundred percent Himalayan hand woven hemp. Um, and it's just west of the area where the Dulong people lived. So I'm, I know it's going to be very thick, but I'll figure it out. Um, well, I hope that that was a useful exercise for the people who were able to see the, the screen, the installation on their screen. Um, but if now I think if anyone has any questions for Colette, um, this now would be the time. I think some people were asking earlier in the chat, you might have answered these questions, but there were, there were some uh, inquiries about kind of like specifically why why the egg, for example? Why, why you chose the egg? The egg why did I chose term? the egg? Um, well, I wanted to, to do a, a new format and um, the, the history of the meow, um, the origin of the meow were, was, was from Butterfly Mother who gave birth to 12 eggs. And hmm. I didn't have time to make 12 eggs um, so I made three and then, um, what you probably can't see is that, so, uh, there's a Jiwi bird that, um, helps is the father, um, of meow people. And there's on this, on the, on the silver brocade, there's actually an image of a bird on there too. So, um, that's why, um, I decided to present those works in eggs and have the imagery in the yolk area, which my sister actually helped me with coming up with um, because I wanted to showcase the, the, um, the, 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 um, the indigo dyed fabric in there that was also um, dyed uh, uh, in um, egg yolk and the handmade paper that I bought in 2014 uh we have some really good questions coming in right now okay. um there's a couple of questions about making um like for example how did you come up with the egg construction and where so, do you make the very large books that's another question so maybe one question at a time okay. where so did the, you come up with the egg so the, the the egg book is based on a kirigami pattern it's it's a common pattern that um that is familiar to many paper engineers. It's also, uh, there's also a term called slice forms, which um, you may be familiar with it with, um, there's a company um, that makes love, it's called Love Pop, they make pop-up cards. So they use slice forms. So um, I guess the, and then, you know, the, that form you, pops up usually in Japanese kirigami by string. Um, but more contemporary versions use paper to pop it up. And what's interesting about that book is to me is it doesn't pop up the way it, it typically pops up. So I struggled really hard to get that to pop up like that. It's very large. I saw that was a question. It's 18 by 18 inches um, all around. And it's heavy because I use um, like a 300 gram paper and I struggled like make it lighter or should I make it heavier? Which way makes it pop up better? Um, and then, so you might have seen in the video that I decided that I wasn't going to get it to pop up on its own because then I would have had to add more string and it just, I didn't like the way it looked. So you see my hand helping it lift up a little bit, but um, typically it doesn't want to pop up that way, but. It was, a, once again, it was another mistake. I measured incorrectly. And when I was struggling to figure out how to get it to work and pop up well, um, I measured wrong and then it worked better and it worked the way I wanted. So it was just bizarre. It's bizarre when that stuff happens. It sounds like there are a lot of happy accidents in your work. You were talking about with the lotus flower, you had a moment of frustration where you crinkled the flower, but then yeah. you liked the effect of that. I think that's really wonderful because the work is so precise. And so to know that there are still happy accidents is really interesting. Well, I want to, can I show you, can I show you this butterfly here? 
Um, yeah. Are you spotlit? Let me make sure you're spotlit. No, you're spotlit. Okay. Um, so this is the this is one of the uh, the new um, kaifunas with the ink with the hemp. And see this butterfly here. It leans back a bit. Um, it needs to lean back partially because it, I don't want it to clash too much with the back, but also um, I didn't want it too perky because her body is perky. So I wanted it to lean back and I was very stubborn about it, but because it's fabric um, with humidity over time, it might fall back. So I just left it like that. I finished everything and I said, um, I need to fix that because if it falls back too much, if it's on exhibit, it's going to interfere with her chin. So do I cut her chin? Do I, do I move things around? And then um, I just um, stopped working on it. I mean, I, I stopped thinking about that. And then I just did everything else. And then in the end, I said, okay, let's go back to that butterfly. And then I realized that if I just stick, stuck another butterfly behind it, um, that's paper, that one supports the fabric butterfly. And then also I can, I'm not, I'm not completely finished yet. Um, now I can add more butterflies to this paper butterfly behind and you can't, and they'll kind of pop out. Oh, I'm sorry. You can I love that. It's like a Russian doll of butterflies. <laughs> you can pop it up, uh, you know, over <laughs> here or over here. There's, there's a lot, this is like the, um, I'm, I think I'm done, but I might add a few more, but um, technically this is the hard part's done. Um, so I want to make sure we get to everyone's questions or, you know, get to as many questions as possible. Someone, this is really interesting, said that they're also a book artist, Chinese book artist themselves. And they said that uh, they found this very inspiring. They love Chinese food. And they said, thank you for sharing Chinese culture with the world. They want to know how often you go back to China and if there is a Chinese book arts community that you can recommend. Um, I have not gone back to China since 2017 um, because I decided I wanted to branch out. So I went to Morocco and then I went to Kyrgyzstan because I wanted, I wanted to um, I photographed the Kyrgyz community in China, but I didn't really like the photos. So I decided to go to Kyrgyzstan and learn felt making and take some pictures of their felt making process over there. And then uh, obviously haven't gone back within the past two years, but I can't wait to go back. Um, I'm really uh, excited to, to take some more photos. I have hundreds, if not thousands of footage, photos st still. But I think to feel inspired, I need to go back. Uh, book arts community in China, I, 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 I did not, um, I did not um, meet any book artists while I was in China. So sorry, I can't make any recommendations on that. Thank you, Colette. Um, there were a couple other production questions. Someone was asking about how exactly you choose the scale of your pieces and why often they're so large. And then someone else was asking about um, whether you make each piece as an addition and then what, how that production process works. So first, um, you know, scale. Scale. So my, my printer is 17 inches. Um, so these most of my books are actually 17 inches on the on the um on the short end and then i just like um so the images are actually 16 and a half by 24 and a half and then um the whole books are 17 by 25 it just it was just a size that i liked um i i i do make them bigger sometimes but um uh the, oh, I'm sorry, what was the other questions? Um, the other question was about producing additions and how many, uh, do you do 10 per, per edition and how does that process work when you're additioning? Uh, so 
I, I have additioned many, um, several books in editions of 10. And then I get so distracted. I, um, I don't enjoy editioning. I, I should say that I enjoyed making the first copy. Then the second, second copy often is, is an improvement on the first copy. And then the third copy, I kind of know what I'm doing. But then after that, it just feels like work. I just much more enjoy the creative process of, of coming up with something. Um, so my additions are, are going to get smaller because um, uh, it's taken me a really long time to finish additions. <laughs> And the reason I addition is because, I mean, that's what a book, generally a book is, 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 is an addition versus a, whether I think if it was a sculpture, um, would be more one of a kind. But um, I, I spend so much time um, designing one book that I feel like I should make more of that. But at the same time, I, I don't enjoy it. <laughs> Well, I think what's really interesting is, you know, you said, you know, most books are additions, but I really do think that in so many ways, these are sculptures and they um, are unique. Even you're saying within like the editioning process, each one you make is a slightly different uh, piece in of itself. Um, and I think that that, um, is so beautiful in just terms of like the handmade quality of these pieces. Um, even though you're incorporating photography, which I think is another really interesting aspect of the work, it's a sculptural book of photographs. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it kind of defies categorization in that way. So I think you get to make your own rules when it comes to auditioning. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I do remember taking a printmaking course and someone telling me that each print had to be the same. Right. So. Um, well, I think that a lot of people are saying thank you. It sounds like we are at the end here. Um, if people want to turn on their cameras to say good night, they're welcome to do so now. Uh, I really appreciate everyone joining us this Friday evening. Colette, bye. Yeah, it's nice to see everyone's or some people's faces. Um, it was wonderful to have Colette speak about her incredible exhibition um, on view through December 11th here at Center for Book Arts. And um, you can always, I've emailed all the event registrants from my work email. So if you ever have any questions about Center for Book Arts or our exhibitions, you can feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Have a good weekend. You too.